I'll be reading from Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses uh, 8 through 11. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think we should know each other better than we do. Um, and, and in a two, <laughs> some of you know me and you, nothing I do or say will surprise you, but this might help some of you understand who I am a little more. Um, I have been asked repeatedly through my life, did your mom drop you on your head? <laughs> and I wonder that sometimes too, I really wonder that because uh, Jeff's reading that scripture and, and this, pops in my head, one of these days, I'm going to do one of those passages of the genealogies. <laughs> just, so whichever guys are volunteering for reading scripture, just be forewarned. <laughs> and it, it'll probably have nothing to do with my lesson whatsoever. Just, I'll get up here and start preaching about something else. And I'm like, what did that have to do with anything? Just making somebody struggle, I guess. I don't know. That's at that point. I will have to beg for mercy from whoever read that scripture because they might be after me afterwards. So All right today, we're going to talk about mercy and speaking of my mom <laughs> You know that that's not at all where I was going with that, but I see where your I see where your mind went uh, <laughs> My mom is about this tall and as you all know, I'm not, I'm not gigantic myself, you know, but my mom's about this big. And there's, uh, I was surprised to find this. I thought, I got to look this up. I wonder if it was just my time period and the region I lived in. But there was a game we played called Mercy. And uh, I looked it up, and sure enough, in Wikipedia, we have a, an explanation of what mercy is. Not a Webster's definition, but a Wikipedia explanation. Mercy, and I didn't know this part, a game, its alternate name was called Pinochle, which makes sense, is a game of strength, skill, endurance, and pain tolerance in Britain, Canada, Pakistan, India, the United States, and elsewhere. It's a lot more popular than I thought. The game is played by two players who grasp each other's hands with interlocking fingers. The aim is to twist the opponent's hand or bend the fingers until the opponent surrenders. Hence the name mercy. You grab someone, interlock your fingers this way, and the way I played it was you bent their hands back until they were on their knees and said mercy. <laughs> Had I known it was so popular, I may have gone into competition. I don't recall ever losing, honestly, ever. I, I used to work with truck tires and car tires. I worked in service stations in high school and, and I had really strong forearms and fingers. And uh, I, was, I was working one time and I had started a new job and I was building something and I asked the supervisor, how tight should I tighten this? And he said, of a grade eight stainless steel bolt in a stainless steel frame, he said, tighten it as tight as you can. And I grabbed the wrench and it went snap. And he turned around and said, not as tight as you can. <laughs> and then I spent two hours drilling out that bolt to replace it. The one person I never beat was my mom. I could not make her say mercy. She has something weird in her hands. <laughs> she can lock her wrists and honestly, totally truthfully, I could not bend her wrist back. I could probably do it today because I might be able to snap those bones and make her do it. <laughs> but I wouldn't do that because I'm a nice guy and I love my mother. She's been through enough. But the reason I bring that up is because it's important for us to keep in mind there, there is this game and there's something about human uh, nature. We compete. We like to compete. And at times it irritates me. We get out of control with it. I know I do. 
But the thing is, it's important that we learn maybe from the competition of human nature, the good naturedness of it, uh, the sports that we play, the games that we in, uh, involve ourselves in, board games, what have you. Uh, it's important to learn that sometimes we can get beat down into submission. Monopoly is one of those games. You play until you're broke or you win. That's cruel, heartless. Mercy is kind of the, boy, that's just the, not, not a thinking man's game. You just lock hands and you go till somebody is on their knees and says, mercy. Some of you might've played something where it was, the end of it was the word uncle. I don't know where that came from, except for having three uncles. I know where that came from. <laughs> But it's important for us to apply some of the things we learn in our physical world, and I think God intends that to be the case. Learn those physical lessons and apply them to our spiritual life. I don't ever want to be beaten to submission where I have, I have to cry out for mercy. I want to learn the lessons and kind of look at some of the things Jesus taught and figure out, oh, I see what's coming. I'm begging for mercy now, before there's pain. That's a wise thing to do. One of the things that we find is Satan is one who will have no hesitation to beat us into submission. He will drive us to a point in our lives where we've seen the movies, we've lived it ourselves, we've had friends that have been there. You hit rock bottom, there's nowhere to go but up. Satan will drive you there if he can, because that's where a lot of people give up, is right at rock bottom. Well, Satan has one of his better weapons, and it is half-truth. To just tell us part of the story, I think he started it right at the beginning when he said to Eve, you will not surely die. You'll be wise like God. Well, part of that was an out and out lie, but she didn't die right away. It was kind of a half truth and maybe that's how he tried to justify it, but he, he tried to appeal to her with the good side of it. But Satan tells us half truths all the time. The world is filled with people telling us half truths to get their way. One of the things that Satan convinces us to tell ourselves. God wants me to be happy. That is probably one of the most dangerous things we can tell ourselves. Not that it's untrue. God does indeed want us to ha be happy. But that's only part of the story. I'm the same way with the people around me. I want them to be happy. I want my children to be happy. I want my grandchildren to be happy. I want my friends to be happy. I want you to be happy. And God is just like that with us. He wants us to be happy. The thing is, just like with my children, my grandchildren, my friends, the people that I work with, not at the expense of doing something wrong. And with God, not at the expense of disobedience to him. There are millions, if not billions of people alive today who think God wants me to be happy. And that's the end of it. I've heard people say it constantly. Well, God wants me to be happy. And maybe you think that too. And the, the thing is, yeah, that's the scary part is that is true. God wants us to be happy, but not at any cost. The cost is giving up our soul if we ignore the rest. And that's scary. I'm kind of the same way with my children. And I was definitely, you can ask Amanda, I was far more strict with her than I am with the grandchildren. I know I'm probably the rare occasion here, but <laughs> I learned over time that I can pick my battles. Part of it is I'm just more tired. The kids wore me down, the grandkids just, they get the tired version, so I don't fight them as much. But I, I, I learned to pick my battles. But the thing is, even with the grandchildren, at a certain point, I want them to be happy. I want them to have whatever makes them smile and love me and, you know, be, want to be with me and play with grandpa and all those things. But there does come a time where I have to draw a line. Sometimes it's for their own safety. I just, you know, they want to jump off of the top of the truck. Well, 
no, we're not going to do that because it's seven feet down from the top of my truck. So we don't want to do that. Sometimes they're not very happy when I tell them no. God's the same way with us. The things that he puts as commands for us, if you want to call it that, are for our own good. And any of us who have been around a while have seen that in our lives. We have disobeyed, lived through the consequences, and we can look back and say, wow, God really knew what he was talking about. I wish I had listened to him. God wants us to be happy, but not at the expense of endangering ourselves physically or spiritually. In John chapter 15 and verse 11, <clears throat> it says, These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. That's Jesus talking to his disciples. He wanted them to be joyful. But that isn't the end of the story. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, we find a place where things were critical. Cain and Abel were having some issues. Cain was incredibly upset because God hadn't revered his offering. And we're not sure exactly what was involved in that. But Cain wasn't happy. He was jealous of Abel. And God came to him and told him, here's how you can stay happy. Why are you unhappy? And he says to Cain, if you do well, in our common terms, if you do what's right, will your face not be cheerful? If you do what's right, you will be happier. And God said that to Cain. But if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. We have to do better than just whatever we want to do. We have to do what is right. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, it says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and follow his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. A lot of people will look at that passage and say, but his commandments are burdensome. They're tough. It depends on your view of it. But after you've disobeyed God's commands and lived through the consequences, I think almost any of us would say, yeah, compared to what we bring on ourselves, obeying God is not the toughest part. God does want us to be happy, but he shows us that proving to do what is right and following what he says shows our real love, where our real commitment is. Satan will tell you to tell yourself, God wants me to be happy, but not at the expense of disobedience to him. And that's the truth of it. Another half truth that Satan will tell us, I can do anything I want. That's also true. I had one uh, study years ago, a Bible study, and I was studying with someone, and they had studied before, and they'd even studied with a, somebody from the Church of Christ. They knew where I was going. We got kind of to the end of the study, and they stopped, and they said, Aha, you're going to tell me I have to be baptized now. It wasn't really my brilliance, but I, I thought, Well, no, I know they don't. I said, No, you don't have to be baptized. And that, that shocked them when I said, you don't have to be baptized, because that's kind of where they were coming from. I said, you just have to be willing to deal with the consequences of turning that down. <laughs> that was years ago, and that kind of made them stop in their tracks and made them think. Because sometimes we just argue the point just to win the point. And in a sense, I conceded them. No, you don't have to be baptized, and you don't. Really, this is the ultimate truth right here. And God will tell you that. You can do whatever you want for now. But that kind of comes to the scripture reading we had. I can do anything I want as long as I'm willing to face the consequences. I told someone else one time that was kind of giving me that, well, I can do whatever I want. They were being kind of rebellious. I said, yep, you can go rob banks if you want to. I could go rob banks. 
but you better be ready to get caught and go to prison because it'll probably happen. And people think that's strange when you could just hit it and you agree with them and go, yep, do whatever you want and then take it to the extreme. You can go get a rifle and just start shooting people. You can do whatever you want. And that's kind of harsh, but you know what? People do that. Thing is, you're gonna have to deal with the consequences. Usually you don't survive that. And if you do, you're gonna spend the rest of your life in prison. That's your best case scenario. And on top of that, the eternal consequences. You can do whatever you want. You can choose, and God will tell you that. In Joshua 24, and verse 15, way, way, way back, Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. He told the Jews, you choose. It's your right. You get to choose. And we have that right as well. I've always been impressed with one, the, one particular episode in Jesus' life when the rich young ruler came to him and said, what do I have to do? Jesus said, keep all the commandments. And he replied, well, I've done that from my youth. Jesus didn't argue with him. He didn't tell him, oh, no, you didn't. I remember this time I saw you. Because certainly he had made a mistake somewhere, but Jesus granted him that. Okay, you've done everything the commandments say. Well, what else do I need to do? Sell everything you have and come follow me. And that rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he was rich and he wasn't gonna cross that line. He said, I don't wanna give all that up and he walked away. The thing that impresses me so much about that point in Jesus' life, Jesus let him walk away. Jesus didn't chase him and say, well, how about if you just give half? How about if you donate it to our pool and come follow me? Jesus didn't compromise. He said, here's what you have to do. And he let that young man choose. I, I struggle sometimes with seeing people trying to decide if they're going to follow Christ or not. So imagine what a struggle that was for Jesus to know that man had a certain point he was going to go to, but the riches were too much. He wouldn't cross there, but he was free to choose. In Mark chapter 8, verses 34, it says, And he summoned the crowd together with his disciples and said to them, Here's the tough one. Here's where we really have to choose every day. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus gave people the choice, and he still gives us the choice. One of the things that helps me quite often when I'm struggling, temptations are pushing on me, struggles and trials are pushing on me, I try to remind myself the day I went in the water and came back out, I made my choice. And that helps me be strong in the days that are tough. I just remind myself, I, I already made this decision. I don't even have to deal with this. I decided a long time ago what I was going to do when this event came up. Sometimes I don't always succeed. Sometimes I don't remind myself of that, but that's where we need to be. I can do anything I want, but I have to deal with the consequences. And that kind of ties in with another thing that Satan tries to tell us. He says, I don't have to bow before Jesus. We can be that rebellious. And there are people who do, and there are times we don't. Oh, we wouldn't want to phrase it that way, but when we just make a conscious decision to do what we want, that's what we're saying. I don't have to bow before Jesus. I'm going to do what I want today. That's pretty dangerous. But here's the real full story. I don't have to bow before Jesus until Judgment Day. Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11. Let's look at it again, because that's answering that question. It's countering that statement. Talking about Jesus and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason, 
also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We often look at that from a very positive aspect, and it is, especially for those of us have, who have chosen to bow our knees before him now. Every soul that has ever lived on the face of the earth that lives now that ever will, every creature in heaven, the angels, the elders, all those things listed that we don't even know what they look like, they all already bow, but all of us will, whether we want to or not. I think I would rather choose to bow now than to wait till that last day and have it be forced on me. To imagine the power, the feeling, the sorrow, all the, the peak of terrible emotions that would go with the idea of spiritually being forced to our knees and have to cry out mercy and admit that Jesus is the Christ and to bow before him when we choose not to, but we have no choice because we just will. At some point, God will remove free will. The choice will be taken away we will bow, we will confess. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31, Paul was, I think it was Paul, I'll just throw that in there. Still some debate on that, but I think it was Paul, wrote to the Hebrews, explaining to them how Jesus was far better than the old sacrifice. How the New Testament and the law of Christ, the grace that we have is better than the old law. And in verse 26, he's talking to them about choices they've made. And some of them have kind of chosen to turn their back on Christ. Oh, and, and it not necessarily go back into live an evil life. But there's, oh, I, I like the old law better. I see the sacrifices. I see the temple. I see the tabernacle. I see these things. So it wasn't, it wasn't that they were even saying, why, well, I'm just blatantly going to go follow Satan. They were just turning their back on the grace of Christ and going back to the old law. And that was considered sinning willfully because Jesus went to the cross to put the old law away. He gave his life so we wouldn't have to do that. So it says, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That's terrifying. There is no sacrifice for us if we turn back on God. What is there though, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has ignored the law of Moses is put to death without mercy <clears throat> on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. One of the scariest passages in scripture is the next passage. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's really serious that we give our life to God and there's a great deal of positive to it and most of it is positive, but we need to remind ourselves every now and again not to take this grace and this mercy for granted. It came at a tremendous price and we can't be very uh, casual with it. We have to understand that we have made a decision to follow God. 
and that he takes it seriously. So finding the mercy, not being forced to it, but finding it is a wonderful thing. Jesus talked about the pearl of great price, that treasure that someone discovers and goes, oh, that's worth everything, and it is. Way back in Numbers, it tells us kind of who God is and how eager he is to give this mercy. But the other side of it is there plain to see as well. In Numbers 14, 18, it says, the Lord is slow to anger. Now you talk about patience. I look at the world around us and think, how can he keep putting up with this? I think some places need to be swallowed up. There should be lightning and fire and brimstone coming down in some places that we see. But no, the Lord is very patient. Says he is slow to anger and abundant in mercy, forgiving wrongdoing and violation of his law. That's incredible. Now this is under the old law that we hear people all the time talking about how harsh God was then. But look at what he says here. The Lord is slow to anger, abundant in mercy, forgiving the wrongdoing and violation of his law. But he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. God is serious about justice. He's willing to forgive if we'll somehow find our way to him and seek that mercy. But if we do not, he will have no mercy at the end. God's mercy is available. His grace is boundless, and his justice, though, is certain. The Romans were forgetting a little bit, too, so obviously we don't, sh shouldn't feel bad about needing to be reminded about these things from time to time. But in Romans chapter 6, here were these Christians, and Paul was reminding them, you've made this choice. You need to stand by your decision. And he says, starting in verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Far from it. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. Ah, a new life. How many stories have we heard in our lifetime of all the fairy tales or the movies or the books or even friends that we know, songs on the radio, oh, and looking for a chance to start over, to start fresh. The ultimate opportunity is Christ. The newness of life. That's not even just the appearance of a fresh start. It's not, oh, we get to go and file bankruptcy and we're out of debt. This is the real start, the newness of life that we gain from Christ. But we also have to know, just a few verses later, Paul reminds them, if you don't stick with that, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We have died to sin. But we have this opportunity of this new life. And it is that I may live for Jesus. It's a beautiful thing in reality. We know it is an awe-inspiring thing to think of the mercy that we receive at the hand of God. But we have to be serious about our life in Christ because God is serious about it. We can't tell ourselves half-truths and rationalize away the things that we do. And I'm so glad that you all listen to me preach to myself for all this time. <laughs> I need this as much as anyone. I have days I get up and I think, I'm going to do it today. I'm going to go all day today and not do anything wrong. And it's not very long before I think, oh, 
I can't believe I just thought that. That's not right. I am judgmental. I am harsh. I'm unforgiving. Oh, I'm mean sometimes. We all are. But thankfully, we have the grace and the mercy of Jesus to cover those mistakes that we have made. And we press on. We make the effort every day to live that, live that same, same sinless life that Jesus did. We'll never attain it, maybe from time to time. We'll have a great day and we'll do it, but we're going to slip up again because Satan is attacking us all the time. And God has made provision for that. Jesus went to the cross. He died for us. And if we follow in that pattern, that death to sin, burial, and that resurrection to a new life, we have that mercy continually cleansing us in the sight of God. What an amazing thing God has done for us. If you need that grace and that mercy, if you need to recommit your life to Christ, be serious about your spiritual life and about your path following Christ, we want to offer the opportunity to do that. And if you need to do that, you need help doing that as we all do, please feel free to seek out that assistance. And while we stand and sing, let that be known. Yeah,